Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to uh, to come here again and uh, address this uh, address this audience. Um, uh, and I want to begin by just saying that uh, when Professor Dr. Hoppe initially uh, suggested this theme uh, for my presentation this afternoon, I was very excited about it. Uh, I had uh, published on a similar subject about 15 years ago, and I was very interested in having the opportunity to revisit some of these ideas. And uh, I knew at the time that I was uh, opening a, a can of worms, as uh, the American expression goes, but I didn't realize exactly how big uh, the can was or how many worms were going to be in it uh, when I started uh, snooping around, until I started uh, poking around in there. And uh, as I started to do the, do the research and write this paper, it ended up, uh, I ended up writing a slightly different paper than I had intended to. Uh, and it addresses some uh, questions that are a little bit different than those implied in the title, uh, but they, are, uh, they will, I hope, be of some interest uh, to this group uh, nevertheless. What, ended, what I ended up doing with this project was framing this question of, um, of uh, this multi-legal system in the Ottoman Empire within the broader context of intercommunal relations in the empire, that is to say relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. And so that's really the broader context in which these remarks are framed. And I think that uh, if, if, if um, my uh, remarks have any relevance at all, it's within that particular uh, context rather than perhaps in a more narrow legal, uh, uh, legal context. And in particular, what I try to do in this paper is I try to explore uh, a problem of Ottoman uh, historiography that, uh, that a number of people, including myself, have, uh, have, have explored in different contexts. And that's um, the way in which the state of intercommunal relations changed over time. And most, uh, most students of the Ottoman Empire argue that um, before the 19th century, intercommunal relations, again, that is to say relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the empire, uh, the state of those relations was generally pretty cordial. And I don't want to, to sort of sugarcoat this or anything like that, but it's just to say that in general, the, um, the uh, intercommunal relations before the 19th century are regarded as cordial. Some, uh, some scholars go even, uh, even further than that. But almost everybody agrees that something happens in the 19th century um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to, um, to, um, to vitiate this uh, level of, uh, of relationships. That is to say that intercommunal relationships decline. The, the, the peacefulness of these intercommunal relationships decline during the 19th century. And what I try to do in this paper is to try to explore why that might be. And what I'm going to suggest is the answer to that question is tied, is tied up with changes in the legal position and the legal administration of the different communities in the empire. So that's what, uh, that's what I'm going to do. And in particular, more to the point, um, what I'm going to argue is before the 19th century, before the 19th century, the Ottoman central administration, the Ottoman central government, largely stayed out of this area. It, to a great extent, it didn't say anything about intercommunal relations. It left, uh, it left those arrangements, it left the, inter, uh, the relations between Muslims and non-Muslims to the local people, the people in the local uh, regions to work out. Um, uh, conversely, it's interesting that it was during the 19th century, the early 19th century, when the Ottoman state began to centralize everything. And, uh, and to some extent, I think the points that, uh, uh, that Mr. Okul brought out were, were, were uh, something connected to this. But during the 19th century, the Ottoman state began a project of centralization, including a centralization and codification of Muslim-non-Muslim relations. And what I hypothesize is that that's connected, that has a causal relationship for the deterioration of the relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the empire. Um, so that's the, the, general, uh, the general hypothesis I wanted to explore, and I'm going to try to do that within the context of law. And, um, and Professor uh, Hope is very, uh, very good opening remarks. He urged us all to have fun, and those of you who know me know I'm a fun-loving kind of guy. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to be doing in this paper is reading a lot of legal cases. 
and reading uh, legal cases, except perhaps for lawyers and masochists, isn't generally considered to be very uh, fun, but I'm going to try to, to make this as, uh, as fun and enjoyable as possible. So I'm just sort of warning you that that's the bulk of the evidence I have for this, uh, uh, for this paper today. Anyway, so before um, I, uh, 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 dive into those, uh, dive into those hilarious uh, knee slappers of legal cases, um, I, want to, uh, I want to say a few words about Ottoman law in general and about uh, the legal uh, position of the Sultan's subjects more generally. Now, this is a, a, a huge topic in and of itself, and what I'm about to say can only barely scratch the surface of it, so I apologize for any errors of omission I, com I may commit here, I'm sure to commit, but this is just a very kind of a very, very brief overview of this. Theoretically, um, in the pre-19th century Ottoman Empire, the Sharia, or the Shariat, as it's called in Turkish, was the supreme law of the land. Um, this was in practice supplemented by other kinds of law, other sources of law. The most important were uh, edicts, imperial edicts, called kanun, related to the Latin word canon, of course, um, and also customary, uh, customary laws. Now, these latter two sources of law, by the way, uh, were largely codified and organized. The kanun and the body of customary law were largely uh, codified and, and uh, reorganized by the great 16th century Ottoman Sultan uh, Suleiman, who the Europeans call uh, the Magnificent, but is known in Turkish as Kanuni, or the lawgiver. Um, now, the uh, Kanun and this customary law were not part of Sharia, uh, but they were not supposed to contradict Sharia either. And the reason I bring this in is because uh, some uh, legal scholars of Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire have, um, have said that sometimes in uh, the legal decisions handed down by the judges, or Qadis, Qada in uh, Turkish, and this evening we're going to the Qadis castle, the Qada uh, 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 Kalisi um, is the name of the town. Um, but the, uh, some scholars have speculated that the, 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 the judges, or the Qadis, when handing down these decisions, sometimes kind of mix these things up a little bit. Uh, so I'm just, the, this is just sort of a caveat that not all of the decisions um, uh, not all of the decisions they reached were based strictly on Sharia, although nothing they decided was supposed to be in direct contradiction to the Sharia. Now, the uh, interesting challenge that the Ottoman authorities faced within this context was that for the first 200 years of their empire, the first 200 years of the uh, Ottoman Empire, the majority of uh, their subjects were not Muslims. And even after that, until the very beginning of the 20th century, non-Muslims made up a very large uh, minority uh, in the empire. So the question then that faced the early Ottoman sultans were how were they to rule their non-Muslim subjects. Now here we need to get into some of the turf wars of Ottoman history, and in particular uh, Ottoman historiography, and in particular the very contentious literature surrounding what has come to be called the Milet system. And here I'm going to engage in a little, uh, a little uh, uh, myth, myth breaking here. Uh, until very, very recently, until the past 20 years or so, um, the accepted story about how the sultans governed their non-Muslim subjects had to do with this thing uh, called the Milet system. And this story goes like this. Um, after, 19, for, uh, after 14, uh, 1453, uh, after the, conquest of the, Mus uh, the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, uh, the sultan established three nations, or Milets, um, and these three were the Greek Orthodox Milet, the Armenian Gregorian Milet, and the Jewish Milet. And each one of the, the two Christian Milets were headed by the patriarchs of those, uh, of those particular uh, faiths, and the Jewish Milet was headed by a, a, a person uh, with the title of Grand Rabbi. And all three of them had their headquarters in Constantinople. And the story continues, around each of these people, uh, each of these religious figures, uh, the Ottomans built a system in which the three different milets, these three different non-Muslim communities, were ruled by their religious authorities. And these clerics were in charge of education, taxation, and the legal administration of each milet, and were responsible to their respective patriarchs, or grand rabbi, as the case may be, in Constantinople, who was in turn responsible to the sultan. Now this story of the milet system, it was also usually, not always, but frequently in the historiographic, in the historiography, it was tied to a general view of intercommunal relations in which the non-Muslim population uh, was strictly segregated from the Muslim one, where these two communities were strictly segregated, kept strictly apart from one another, uh, only interacting very rarely 
and in very superficial ways. And many versions of this story also, implicitly or explicitly, uh, include a kind of oppression narrative um, uh, in which um, this, this millet system is part of a broader system of Muslim oppression of the Christians. And in this, in this kind of narrative, the millet system functions as a way of keeping the Christian population subjugated to its clerical masters, who in turn were slaves of the sultan. Now, this uh, story, what's very interesting about this story, is that it was developed largely in the 19th century by European scholars who relied on the oral traditions of the Christian communities. And uh, during the uh, second half of the 20th century, when people actually learned how to read the Ottoman sources and went into the Ottoman archives and started poking around, uh, what was very interesting was that they found no evidence of this at all. They couldn't find any evidence uh, that, this, um, that such a system ever existed. What was very interesting, though, is when they were starting to do this research in the 19th century, it did exist. So what probably happened was that in the 19th century, as this very system was developing, the people back projected this onto an earlier time. They invented these foundation myths to explain the existing uh, realities of the time. So, so in other words, um, it, most uh, virtually all Ottoman historians today believe that there was no system in the sense of there being a sense, and the Ottomans, by the way, loved systems. They had systems for all sorts of other things. Um, but there was no actual system uh, for regulating Muslim, non-Muslim relations in the sense of there having been a centralized, codified, regular set of rules and relations governing the conduct of the non-Muslim uh, population uh, uh, through a, a central administration, a central clerical administration based in Istanbul. Now, there were indeed uh, Greek Orthodox or Orthodox Christian and uh, Gregorian Armenian patriarchs in Istanbul from very early, at least since the end of the 1400s. Um, but those people seem, until very, very late in the history of the empire, to have been responsible really just for their flocks there in and around uh, the, uh, the uh, imperial metropolis. So most uh, historians now say that instead of a systematic organization for ruling the non-Muslim population, the Ottoman central administration more or less left the local communities to figure it out for themselves. They left the local communities up to figuring these matters out uh, for themselves, so that in many ways what we end up with is a kind of communal autonomy for the non-Muslim peoples of the empire that resembles the structures of this so-called millet system. But importantly, these institutions and practices were the result of local forces and customs, in many cases predating uh, the Ottoman conquest. So for example, the local parish priests um, in, uh, um, in, in say, the, in, say uh, Ottoman uh, southeastern Europe were perfectly uh, free to build and staff their own schools uh, and to, to, in which they could teach in their own languages. Uh, similarly, uh, Christian and Jewish uh, clerics were free to carry on any sort of religious or theological uh, debates that they might have uh, with one another. Um, this also implies some very interesting things about the familiar narrative of segregation and oppression that accompanied uh, much of the older writing about the Millet system. So this new way of thinking about um, Ottoman uh, intercommunal relations in the pre-19th century, um, rather than uh, presenting a landscape in which Muslims were superior to Christians per se, as blocks of people, as groups of people, um, instead, this new research demonstrates that demonstrates or suggests, might be a better way of putting it, since a lot of this is still tentative, that individual social and political power uh, was much more, that, in, that, that individual social and political power was much more a function of wealth, connections to important individuals, or personal charisma, uh, and other factors than simply being a member of one or the other of these, uh, of these religious communities. Now, I want to avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. Because the growing consensus among Ottoman historians about this uh, Millet system, this revisionist uh, literature, questions only the notion that the non-Muslim communities were ruled directly from the capital, from Istanbul, um, through their different church authorities. The idea that the local non-Muslim communities retained legal and confessional autonomy has been generally retained. And that's what I want to do with the second part of my remarks, is explore that. This legal, and, uh, this legal and communal autonomy that existed on the local level on the basis of these local, uh, local arrangements. 
So what did this legal autonomy look like? I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, the non-Muslim uh, uh, population, uh, generally, in, in terms of legal matters now, um, uh, the non-Muslim population um, had the option to use its own laws and its own courts. So if there were ever a dispute, if, uh, a, a dispute between uh, two members of, a, of, a, of um, a Christian or Jewish community, uh, they could use their own courts, staffed by their local clerical authorities. Similarly, these local courts had wide authority on matters of personal law, so inheritance, marriage, divorce, um, things like that. Now, there were a few exceptions to this general, uh, to a few exceptions to this rule. So capital crimes, for instance, and acts of rebellion or sedition were always tried in the Sharia courts. As were, and this is very important, as were crimes or suits, crimes or legal suits, involving members of different religious communities. So in other words, if a, if a Christian had a, brought a suit against a Muslim, that was tried in the Sharia court. Now the older literature on the subject, in keeping with this overall narrative of, an, of a, a generally oppressed Christian population, always made very much of the fact that in these cases, the cases in which a Christian and Muslim were both involved, one, the case was tried in a Sharia court, and in a Sharia court, non-Muslims could not testify as witnesses against Muslims. And this fact uh, has been endlessly repeated in the secondary literature, usually with the implication that it left the non-Muslims completely at the mercy of their, uh, Muslim, uh, of their Muslim accusers. Now what I want to do with the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to unpack this uh, a little bit and to look at some recent studies of court rec records. These are um, some uh, uh, two uh, very interesting uh, sources I found. Uh, in which scholars examined thousands of court records, actually went and looked at the records of these Sharia courts uh, to see what they could find in them. And these are both from the 18th century, so they're rather late, but they predate the period of centralization of the empire. Um, and they're from two very different places. There's a, one study is from um, Ottoman Syria, 18th century Ottoman Syria, by uh, Najwal al Khatan, And the second one is from Ottoman Cyprus by Kemal Chichek. And what these works suggest is that the Muslim and non-Muslim populations seem to have been remarkably well integrated, that they don't seem to have been segregated at all. Um, they seem to have been closely tied together by commercial, residential, and personal relations. They also suggest, at least in these two times and places, so we have to be careful to combine ourselves really to the, the evidence we have here, but still, um, this evidence suggests that um, non-Muslims readily made use of the Sharia courts um, instead, of, uh, instead of their own um, courts, even when they had disputes with one another. Um, I'm going to skip over uh, some more of this, I think, and go right to, the, uh, uh, right to some of these cases, because I know that's what you're all waiting to hear. Uh, so let me just see if there's anything else here we need to do by. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, I think we can skip that. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's then just take a look at some of these um, cases uh, and see what we find. And again, the things I was interested in exploring here were a couple, of, uh, a couple of things. One, what do these cases tell us about the way that Muslims and non-Muslims interacted in, in, general, in general terms? And then secondly, what do these cases tell us about how they interacted legally uh, in a court of law, especially in cases where Muslims and Christians were in court together, where Christians, remember, could not testify as witnesses uh, against Muslims. So first of all, let's look at, uh, let's look at um, a, uh, a couple of cases in which uh, non-Muslims are involved. Now remember, non-Muslims, as long as the, uh, as, as for personal law or things like that, they were not obliged to go to the Sharia court. They could go to their own courts, which had the force of law. So um, these cases are particularly interesting, uh, I think, again, because they involve uh, non-Muslims. Uh, non and a lot of these uh, non-Muslim cases um, actually involve cases of uh, inheritance or divorce because the, uh, the, Quran, the, the Sharia has different rules about inheritance and divorce. And for certain kinds of people, especially women, uh, they were actually more, um, uh, women, women considered them uh, more strategically beneficial to go to a Sharia court instead of their own court. And I'll give you just a couple of cases here. This first one is from, uh, is from uh, Chichek's article on uh, Ottoman Cyprus. Um, uh, Pavli Bintiani, of the village of Samaria in Kyrenia, 
brought a claim against Andoni de Valiat Loyoso, claiming that the legacy of her deceased son, Siracco, should be given to her. But the deceased's cousin took as his share one ox and 40 goats, claiming that he was one of the heirs. She further drew the attention of the Qada to the fact that according to the Islamic law of inheritance, this is an a, a, a Orthodox Christian woman pleading her case to the Qada. She said, according to the Islamic law of inheritance, he, her cousin, could not be heir to the estate of her son as one of his cousins. Having learned and confirmed by the witnesses that the defendant was indeed the deceased's cousin, the Qada ruled out his heirship according to the Sharia and ordered the defendant to return the property mentioned to the claim. So wasn't that interesting? First of all, it challenges some of our maybe ideas about the subservience uh, and the general picture we have of a subservient, oppressed, silent female population. Um, and it also suggests some interesting things about what the Christian population knew about the Sharia and about the particulars of uh, Sharia, at least in terms of inheritance. I mentioned uh, the matter of divorce. According to um, canon law, it was very difficult for Christians or Jews to, Christian or Jewish women to initiate divorce proceedings, but that's allowed in the Sharia. So we find a lot of cases of divorce in Sharia courts. Uh, these are a couple, and these are just summaries by, um, by uh, Dr. Al-Khatan um, that I wanted to, to, just, uh, to just mention. Um, uh, in 1781, Mariam bin Francis Walad Antun went to the Muslim court in Damascus in order to terminate her marriage to Yusuf Walid Musa al Um She also submitted to the court that she voluntarily released him from material support as well as from his debts. So he was getting off easy, whatever the case was. Uh, he, in turn, agreed to pay child support for their infant son in the amount of 140 kurush for seven years. Here's another case. Um, Rama, uh, Rama bin Shihada uh, went to court with two Muslim men. So she brought two Muslim wit witnesses, even though this was an uh, intra-Jewish uh, 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 matter. Two Muslim men who presented her case regarding her marriage to Arutin Walid Abdal al-Rumi. The latter had, shortly after marrying and living with her for a year and five months before her court appearance, left town and abandoned her without material support. After taking an oath as to the veracity of her claims, she requested divorce, which the Qadi, who first advised patience, granted her. So again, this, this is a very personal matter, uh, an intra-communal intra case, uh, but um, this, uh, these women decided to take these cases to the, um, uh, to the Sharia court in Damascus. Now let's move uh, rapidly on to cases where Muslims brought suit against Christians. What's very interesting in the case, uh, uh, Chichek, in his examination of the court records in Cyprus, uh, found about 2,000, he used about, uh, examined about 2,000 cases altogether, and in those, 17% of those cases involved suits brought by Muslims against Christians. Now, we would think that the uh, Muslims, um, uh, the older secondary literature seems to have assumed that the Muslims routinely capitalized on their legal advantages to use the courts to oppress the non-Muslims, um, but the cases presented by Chichek and Al-Qatan uh, complicate this picture considerably. Uh, both claim, and they don't provide me all of their cases, but uh, both claim that they find only a handful of cases which are obviously motivated by such crass considerations. And the cases in which that they do present uh, are cases, there are many cases in which Muslims actually lose their suits. And here are a couple that I thought were, uh, were really particularly, uh, particularly interesting. This is, a, this is a case of a recent convert. One would expect that in a, in a case like this, the Qadi, if he was motivated by some sort of uh, uh, crass prejudic prejudicial concerns, might uh, want to side with a recent convert to Islam. But let's see uh, how this case turns out. Mustafa, a Christian man who had converted to Islam 10 days earlier, he had just converted, sued his still Christian mother Mariam bin Mikhail, for allegedly holding his share of the legacy left by his long deceased father. In its summary of the case, the court recognized the religious affiliations just mentioned, but proceeded to rule on the case by reference to the Sharia rule of evidence, which in this case vindicated the defendant in spite of her religion and gender. So this was a case where, uh, where the, the uh, Muslim uh, accuser uh, lost. Here's another similar case. This one involves a loan dispute. Uh, this one also, I think, is uh, very interesting on a number of levels. So this is from 17th of November, 1713 in Cyprus. 
Halil Besha ibn Hussein of the Lefkonic village in Mesharia accused your Yuvalid Pavlo of not paying his debt of 20 kurush, which he had lent him previously. He demanded from the Qada, so this is the Muslim, Halil, uh, Halil Beshe, uh, demanded from the Qada that Yorgi should be made to pay his debt. However, when the Qada asked to set forth evidence for his accusation, he failed to provide the court with any concrete evidence. Therefore, in accordance with the Sharia, the Qada offered the accused Yorgi an oath of innocence. Yorgi swore by the God who sent down the gospel on Jesus, blessings be upon him. Accordingly, the accuser has been prohibited from litigation without evidence. Now again, this is a very interesting case, not only because the Qada ruled in favor of the Christian, but that he let him swear his oath of innocence um, on, the, uh, on the gospel. Um, the, next, uh, the next set of cases I wanted to look at, and I'm almost done here, um, is cases where Christians brought suit against Muslims. Now here again, one thing I found interesting was that in the cases from Cyprus, uh, Dr. Chichek found 70% of all these cases um, that involved both Muslims and Christians were Muslims bringing suit against Christians, and 16% of these intercommunal cases were Christians bringing suit against Muslims, almost exactly the same proportions of these guys suing one another. Um, um, so, uh, but again, uh, the Christians are uh, uh, allegedly um, um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in a very weak uh, state because they can't bring, uh, they can't testify against uh, Muslims. So here's a case. This one I thought was very interesting because this is a high-level case. This is right at. This is really kind of, kind of a, a Washington Post material here. Um, this was from the 20th of May, 1709. Uh, Papa Filippo Valet Filippo, so a priest. Papa Filippo of the uh, Terbiondi Quarter in Nicosia brought a suit against the Kehude that's a kind of um, steward or major domo, a very important uh, figure, the Kehuda uh, Mehmet Aga Ibn Abdul Rahman. Uh, his statement was as follows. This is the priest giving the statement to the court. The accused Kehuda came to my premises and accused me of preparing to complain to the imperial government about him and his men. He, uh, he forced uh, me to give him 50 kurush in cash and cloth worth 16 kurush. When I complained at the office of the vizier of the island, Yusuf Pasha, he admitted that he took from my premises illegally the stated amount of cloth and money, yet he still had not given it back. The Qada asked the, uh, the said uh, Ketida about the incident, but he denied the charge. Upon his denial, the Qada asked the accuser to bring forth evidence. So the Qada asked the priest, okay, where's your evidence? The priest presented two respectable Muslim witnesses. Um, the Zaim, or a, a kind of a thief holder, I guess, uh, uh, Mustafa Aga of the Karamanzade quarter, and Zaim Ali Aga of the Ara Ahmad Pasha quarter. The witnesses, these two uh, high powered Muslim witnesses, testified on behalf of the accuser, the priest, Papa Filippo, that the accused had previously admitted the charge in the council of the then governor. The Qada ordered the defendant to return the cloth and the money immediately. Um, what a case. Uh, there are all kinds of other things going on there, some issues of loyalty and uh, uh, maybe some uh, 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 other kinds of uh, internal, uh, internal politics. But again, the priest is able to get two very high-powered uh, Muslim witnesses to testify against a very important uh, member of their uh, own religious community. Since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to uh, read, uh, read the rest of these. Um, but I do just want to uh, wrap this up by saying that um, uh, these data do have uh, some, uh, some problems, it seems to me. First of all, we don't know from these secondary sources what percentage of suits were won by Christians uh, or Muslims. It seems that this information could tell us something uh, about, this, uh, about my hypothesis. But it still seems to me that the very wide range of cases we have here involving people from different classes uh, seem to suggest that the blatant anti-Christian uh, rulings by the Qada, uh, if they did exist in this body of data, were probably exceptional. Furthermore, the fact that such a large percentage of cases involved Christians choosing to use the Sharia court to bring suit against their fellows suggests that they must have had at least some trust in these authorities. Otherwise, they just would have gone to their own clerical courts to have these intra-religious uh, disputes uh, resolved. Uh, perhaps even more interestingly, however, uh, is that we can use these cases to reconstruct a picture of what life was like for these people. Rather than a population segregated, strictly segregated along religious lines, it seems like 
uh, Christians, uh, the Christians and uh, Jews and Muslims in Ottoman Cyprus and Syria had all sorts of relationships with one another as businessmen, workers, farmers, um, uh, uh, administrators, uh, and so on. And this situation helps to explain the sorts of remarkably mixed settlement patterns that one finds in the Balkans and much of the Middle East well into the 20th century. Um, I began my presentation with some words about the challenges to the old idea of the Ottoman Millet system, and I want to close with a kind of postscript about the fate of the system. Because as a matter of fact, such a system, an actual system, uh, was indeed established in the Ottoman Empire during the 19th century. And what's fascinating about this, from my point of view, is that, it, is that the Ottomans set up this system, the 19th century Millet system, as part of their overall centralizing project involving all of their subjects. In other words, the point the Ottomans had in setting up the Millet system in the 19th century was not really to provide autonomy for the non-Muslim population, or anyone for that matter. It was part of their overall project of centralizing all authority in the imperial government. The Ottoman administrators and bureaucrats of this period wanted to systematize and centralize the state's relationships with all its subjects. What this meant for the non-Muslims was the subjugation of all of their communities throughout the entire empire, not to their local authorities or to any sort of local, uh, local traditions that had uh, grown up over the centuries, but um, to their respective patriarchs in Constantinople. It also meant a regularization of all of their laws and traditions. To further complicate this matter, the Ottoman authorities were simultaneously introducing new secular law codes on top of all of this, uh, based on European models to which everyone was subject without regard to their religion. Ironically, this strategy contributed to the growth of intercommunal tension. Very quickly, the Muslim and non-Muslim residents of the small towns and the countryside of the empire came to see themselves not as fellow farmers or fellow residents of the same village uh, who maybe had personal connections or interests based on their local, uh, local, uh, uh, local uh, uh, economic and personal interactions, but as members of great and powerful organizations with their centers in far off Istanbul. To make matters more contentious still, the numerous ethnic and linguistic communities lumped into these new state-sponsored milets soon chafed at their control by the distant patriarchs. Thus, in the most famous example, Bulgarian-speaking Orthodox Christians and their parish priests found themselves under increasingly direct rule from the Orthodox patriarch, almost always a Greek, in Istanbul. The increased tensions between the Bulgarian and Greek-speaking congregations in the empire led to the demands by the Bulgarians for their own millet, which was then granted by the Sultan in 1870. Finally, growing numbers of secular-minded intellectuals educated in Europe had imbibed the ideals of the Enlightenment and Romantic nationalism. They saw in these new millets not the more or less arbitrarily created bodies of the centralizing Ottoman state, but as embryonic national states. And they used those millets then as vehicles for their national project. The efforts of these young nationalists ultimately destroyed the empire and created untold suffering for millions of people. Thank you very much.